House of the Dragon Season 1 is borderline a masterpiece. Never in a million years did I think that the first season of House of the Dragon could rival the first season of Game of Thrones. Regardless of whether or not you liked the first season or whether or not you think it's as good as Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon put the Game of Thrones franchise back on the map. How did this happen? How did a franchise that seemed dead for three years make such an explosive return? How did House of the Dragon capture the magic of what made the early seasons of Game of Thrones so great. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. My name is The Goldman and today we're talking about House of the Dragon Season 1 and why it's great. This video will contain spoilers for the entire Game of Thrones series and only season one of House of the Dragon, so you won't have to worry about spoilers from the books about what's going to happen in the rest of House of the Dragon. What makes the Game of Thrones universe work so well? Why did people fall in love with the early seasons of Game of Thrones and now the first season of House of the Dragon? Well, there are mostly two reasons. One is the way that the world of Westeros is designed, and the other is Martin's rules of writing. What makes the world of Westeros so compelling from a narrative perspective? Well, feudalism makes for fantastic storytelling. The core of any great drama is the relationships between the characters. It doesn't matter how great the visuals look or how dense the battles are, if the characters aren't three-dimensional and if the characters' relationships aren't well established, then your story has failed as a political drama. In a feudalistic world such as Westeros, the intimate relationships between a small group of people have immense consequences. In the modern world, if I were to go to someone and murder them, then their family and close friends will be extremely pissed, sure, but they don't have the ability to draw an army to their side, and neither do I. In dramas that take place in modern day Earth, the consequences of character relationships are usually smaller in scale. In a feudalistic world like Westeros, if someone from House A kills someone from House B, then depending on how important those houses are, thousands of people can be drawn to war. In the original Game of Thrones, when Joffrey orders the execution of Ned Stark, the entire North marches to war. In the first episode of House of the Dragon, when we see Viserys' heir and wife die, the consequences of said deaths can affect the stability of the entire realm. Viewers are often drawn to stakes. The more something is at stake, then the easier it is for the story to grab the audience's attention. In Game of Thrones, the consequences of character relationships are amplified to the highest extreme, often resulting in country-wide war. If character A pisses off character B, thousands of lives are instantly at stake. So that is why feudalism makes for great storytelling, especially if said story story is a drama. Now, feudalism doesn't instantly make a story great, of course. The rules that Martin's storytelling follows are equally as essential to the Game of Thrones universe. In my Game of Thrones three years later video, I spoke about a rule that is a fundamental part of the DNA of Game of Thrones, and that rule is that characters suffer the realistic consequences of their actions. What does it mean to say actions have consequences? When you are watching a show or movie and a character does something, ask yourself what is the realistic thing that would happen here and did that happen in the story. When a farm boy and a smuggler enact a plan to sneak through a heavily fortified base and rescue a princess, they will most likely get caught. If a character risks their lives time and time again in battle, they will most likely die at some point. When an action is taken, will that cause a chain of events to follow or will nothing result from it? In Game of Thrones, when a character makes a decision, it doesn't matter what the intent behind said decision was. That character is going to face the realistic consequences of said action. With Ned Stark, he found out the truth about the legitimacy of Cersei's children. He did the kind thing and warned her that he would tell the king and that she needed to find safety. Well, it doesn't matter that he did the kind thing. Cersei struck back and got him arrested and thus executed for his actions. Ned Stark told the truth and died because of it. Rob Stark swore an oath that he would marry Walder Frey's daughter. When he broke that oath and married someone else, Walder Frey didn't forgive him even though Rob is a good man at heart. He executed him because he is a dick and he was pissed off. Game of Thrones is like a chessboard. Every single piece that is moved and where it is moved has an immense effect on the rest of the game. Moving your pawn up two squares will start a chain reaction of events that will affect every single move for the rest of the game. In Game of Thrones, every decision that is made will affect the characters for the rest of the show, good or bad. The early seasons of Game of Thrones did this and House of the Dragon continued that tradition. Many complain that these episodes drag on and that the story is too 
slow. Well, the reason that isn't true is because every scene and every line of dialogue has a purpose, and what happens in scene A will affect scene B, scene C, and every scene to follow. And this isn't just the case with the scenes. It's the case with everything. One thing leads to the next, and so on. That builds momentum, and momentum is essential for a story to be compelling. Viserys' wife and son die, so he decides to name a girl as his heir and chooses a new wife. What are the realistic consequences of this? Well, in this world, naming a woman to be heir to the kingdom is a big no-no and will piss off a lot of the lords, and choosing a new wife will likely lead to new children, which could likely lead to a new son. Rhaenyra and Alicent start beefing with each other because of Viserys' decisions. What are the consequences of that? Well, Alicent and Rhaenyra both hate each other and they begin to subconsciously teach their children to hate each other as well. What happens when their children will hate each other? Well, one may try and torment the other and accidentally get them killed, which will lead to a countrywide war. This is called momentum, and it's why House of the Dragon worked so well. In a moment, I'm gonna go in depth with each of the main characters and explain this further, but another important aspect of the characters in House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones is that the characters are all mostly active characters. An active character is a character that makes decisions, and a passive character is a character that lets things happen to them. The reason why this is so important for characters to be active is because when characters make decisions, we learn about their personality. Again, I'm going to provide examples when I go in depth with each character, so stay tuned. Another point that I want to touch on briefly is the biggest difference between Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon, and that is the scope. Game of Thrones' scope was huge. At its peak, the show was following almost a dozen storylines and three times as many characters. House of the Dragon only follows one story and maybe a dozen characters. House of the Dragon is focused on the Targaryen family and the relationships between all the characters. It's been stated that the entire season one is pretty much set up for the main story that will begin in season two. Characters are going to make decisions in season two and onward, and the storytellers are devoting an entire season to answer why these characters are making those decisions. In Game of Thrones, the main conflict began rather quickly, and that show revealed to us why characters are the way that they are as the story progressed. In House of the Dragon, since there is so much backstory to the main conflict, the storytellers understand that they can use this time narratively to also establish the relationships between the characters. Unlike Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon is not based on a novel, but a history of Westeros book. These events are mostly written as bullet notes that summarize the entire story into a few chapters, so it could have been easy for the writers to begin this show at episode 6 and summarize the first five episodes in either a prologue or throwaway dialogue. But while you can summarize events in a few lines of dialogue, you cannot build character relationships with a few lines of dialogue. By the time the first season ends, I can summarize in depth the personalities of the characters, how they feel about each other, and most importantly, why they are who they are and why they feel the way that they do. And these are the building blocks of House of the Dragon. It is now time to dive deep into the characters and see how all of this applies to them individually. First, let's discuss arguably the protagonist of the story, Rhaenyra Targaryen. Usually when I devote sections of an entire video to a singular character, I like to talk about the arc said character goes on and if it conveys a powerful message. Now, does House of the Dragon have a message or theme to the story? Well, kinda. I think House of the Dragon illustrates how people and relationships can be largely formed by their environments. The way House of the Dragon explores that is through its criticism of feudalism. While feudalism makes for great storytelling, House the Dragon perfectly illustrates how dumb of a political system it truly is. So let's take a look at Rhaenyra, her story, and how it all reflects that idea. Rhaenyra begins the story not as someone who is a rebel, but as someone who personally contradicts everything the Westerosi political system represents. She's not interested in marrying or having kids, she just wants to explore the world with her best friend Alicent. When her mom tells her that her duty is to bear children, she rejects the notion and claims she'd rather be a knight. Her mother eventually dies, and Viserys, feeling guilty, names Rhaenyra his heir. Rhaenyra, like her father, initially has no interest in being a ruler, but after he tells her about the Song of Ice and Fire, she feels compelled to honor her duty. For the first two episodes, Rhaenyra is shown to have only one friend, Alicent. And what happens? Alicent is essentially forced to become the queen and marry Rhaenyra's father. Throughout the season, we kinda see Rhaenyra as the good guy, but one thing House of the Dragon does excellently is that everyone is incredibly flawed. Alicent was pretty much chosen to be the 
queen against her will, but Rhaenyra still holds a grudge and blames her for it. Alicent tries to be friends, but Rhaenyra wants no part of it. Remember earlier I said active characters make decisions and their actions have consequences? Well, here we see an action she makes and how it will have terrible consequences. Rhaenyra treats her other half of her family with a cold shoulder. She doesn't see Aegon as her little brother, but as someone who exists to steal her birthright. Rhaenyra choosing to be a jerk to Alicent and her children shows us how selfish she kinda was to begin the series. We are never shown this, but if I had to guess, Alicent originally tried to make an effort to build a relationship between Aegon and Rhaenyra, but Rhaenyra wanted no part in it. What consequences stem from Rhaenyra's early behavior? Well, a divide between House Targaryen began because of her. If Rhaenyra took the time to develop a relationship with her younger brother instead of ignoring him, maybe the two could have become extremely close and she would have never resented him for being a claimant to the Iron Throne. Rhaenyra made the decision to be cold to Alicent and Aegon, and she will suffer the realistic consequences of that. But it's not just Rhaenyra who is causing this divide, but the political system as a whole. If women were allowed to become heirs, then she would never resent Aegon and maybe the two could have had a relationship. This is a consequence of the political system. Because she is so fed up with that side of the family, she starts to become a bit of a rebel and we see that in episode 4. Rhaenyra wants to have fun and is tired of the life of a princess. She goes into town, briefly hooks up with Daemon, and then later has sex with Kristen. Unfair or not, Rhaenyra suffered the realistic consequences of being a woman having sex outside of marriage in Game of Thrones. People found out and it became a big deal that drives a dagger in her relationship with Alicent that was just healing. Of course, if Rhaenyra was a man, no one would care if she was sleeping around. Aegon does it later in the series and no one cares. So if the realm didn't treat women as objects to produce heirs, then no one would care about Rhaenyra having sex. Rhaenyra makes two important decisions in the fourth episode. She has sex and she lies to Alicent. Had Rhaenyra told Alicent the truth, sure Alicent would have been upset, but I don't think she would have grown to hate Rhaenyra for the next 10 years. But Rhaenyra swore on her mother's grave that she didn't have sex, and Alicent takes that very seriously. And then in the fifth episode, she agrees to marry Laenor, and they basically agree to an open relationship where they can sleep around. The first five episodes accomplish a few important things with Rhaenyra. Firstly, it shows us what kind of person she is. She isn't going to bow down to the traditions of Westeros. She's going to do what she wants. And later on, she will suffer those consequences, but more on that in a second. The other important thing we see is how her relationship with Alicent devolved. They were best friends for a time, but because of the system they were raised in, Rhaenyra resents Alicent for marrying her father. Remember how I said Rhaenyra suffers the consequences of her open relationship with Laenor? Well, Alicent has a big problem with that, and that leads to another big wedge between the two. Fair or not, Rhaenyra knows it is frowned upon to sleep around as a woman, and she will suffer the consequences. Moving on, 10 years have passed, and Rhaenyra has changed greatly. She has three bastard children with Harwin Strong, but legally they are Laenors. Now, I kinda liked how it was the opposite of Cersei and Robert. There, Robert had no clue Cersei had cucked him for all these years, but with Rhaenyra, Lena knows they aren't his, but he doesn't care. Now, the consequences of Rhaenyra having bastards are pretty much front and center. Had Rhaenyra had trueborn children, then Alicent probably would have agreed to marry Helena to Jaceris and thus prevented the entire war. Now, the show does make an effort to tell us that Rhaenyra tried to have kids with Laenor, but since he's gay, it didn't work out. But no one said Rhaenyra had to have kids with someone else. I believe that if Rhaenyra really wanted to, she could have had a kid with Laenor. In Game of Thrones, when Marjorie is trying to have a kid with Renly, she asks if Laura should come in and help, since Renly was also gay. So I'm sure Rhaenyra and Laenor could have figured it out somehow. So again, Rhaenyra made a decision to sleep around and have bastard kids, and she will end up suffering the realistic consequences of that. I do want to take a second to address a common misconception about Rhaenyra, and it's that she's some feminist leader who is fighting to take down the patriarchy. Sure, she's probably not a fan of it, but Rhaenyra is far from a feminist icon. Rhaenyra is a bit hypocritical at times. She says things like she will create a new order when she is queen, and maybe she would have, but countless times throughout this season, she has the opportunity to openly denounce the patriarchy, but doesn't. When Rhaenys in episode 2 tells her that they won't accept her as a queen because she's a woman, Rhaenyra tells her that the Harrenhal Council didn't reject Rhaenys because she was a woman, but because of who Rhaenys was. Another instance where Rhaenyra not only refused to take down the patriarchy, but also openly supported it was with the succession crisis of Driftmark. If she was a true feminist, then she would support Lena's and Daemon's daughters as the heirs to Driftmark. Lena is older than Laenor, so if women were to be equal, then Lena's kids should be the heirs. Rhaenyra openly supports the system and advocates that her son, Jaceris, should be the heirs to Driftmark. So advocating that Rhaenyra is fighting the patriarchy simply isn't true. Going back to the Driftmark crisis, 
choices? What Rhaenyra does is quite fucked up. She knows that Luke isn't a Valerion, but she's still advocating he be its heir, and anyone who questions otherwise is committing treason. When Vaymond goes to court, he has every right to be pissed off. I would be pissed off if someone who wasn't my blood was stealing my home from me. This just goes to show how even the characters we love are far from perfect. By the last episode, pretty much all the consequences of her actions start to bite her in the ass. For one, I always found it dumb of her and Damon to leave King's Landing. If she really doesn't trust the Greens, then the last thing she should do is leave them with Viserys. Of course, hindsight is 2020, but there is no way I wouldn't have been in King's Landing. But of course, the biggest consequence is the death of Luke. Rhaenyra had 10 years to not only have her children bond with Allison's children, but also bond with her siblings herself. If Rhaenyra was a good sister to Aemon, do you really think Aemon would have terrorized Luke and gotten him killed? No way! Now, of course, this isn't all Rhaenyra's fault. Alicent and Otto and Viserys play a major role in that as well, but she could have been the bigger woman and try to make amends. Now, maybe she did, and it was just glossed over, but given her attitude towards her siblings and the fact that it was never addressed, I think she ghosted all her siblings. Now, one aspect of the season that mildly disappointed me was the aftermath of Lenor's supposed death. Rhaenyra does the kind thing and lets Lenor live instead of killing him. She admits to Damon that part of it was to make everyone fear her and what she's capable of, but she doesn't suffer any consequences for that. Rhaenys and Corlys bring it up a few times that she was complicit in Lenor's death, but ultimately they end up supporting her anyway. Realistically, I don't think Rhaenyra would get away with that. The last episode also gives us a hint as to what kind of ruler Rhaenyra would be. She clearly isn't like some Targaryens who have a heart of violence. She made it her mission to resolve this issue peacefully, but after the death of her son, I don't blame her for what she's about to do next. Rhaenyra was peaceful and she's gonna suffer the consequences of that. Rhaenyra as a whole was a wonderfully developed character. There are plenty of instances throughout the season where she makes decisions that reveal a lot about her character. At her heart, she's a kind person who doesn't want to be tied down by politics. She also has a sense of duty and wants to honor her father whenever possible. We see how the political system destroys her relationship with Alicent and leads to war. But Rhaenyra is not without her flaws. She openly ignored half of her family and treated them like traitors. She openly lies about the legitimacy of her children, which could destroy House Valerion and probably could have been a bit more empathetic towards Alicent being forced to marry her dad. Rhaenyra also honors the tradition of actions having consequences, which is so crucial to the Game of Thrones universe. Up next, we have Alicent Hightower. Many see her as the villain of the show, and it's kinda hard not to. She opposes Rhaenyra at almost every turn and helps usurp her throne in the ninth episode. She also seems jealous of Rhaenyra, which is never a good trait to have in a show. But why is Alicent the way that she is? Remember, House the Dragon wants to focus on why characters are the way that they are and why they make certain decisions. We saw clearly why Rhaenyra makes certain decisions, so let's Let's look at Alicent. Alicent, while beginning the story as best friends with Rhaenyra, is completely the opposite person. Alicent is this religious girl who does what she is told to do. When Otto pimps her out to Viserys, she listens to him. Alicent is maybe the biggest victim of the patriarchy. She never wanted to marry Viserys, she was essentially forced to do so. I love the little detail of Alicent picking at her fingers to show how stressed she was in the beginning of the series. Alicent is forced to have Viserys' kids, and her life as queen has often led her to feeling incredibly lonely. Now before with Rhaenyra, I talked about how she made plenty of active decisions that revealed to us a lot about her character. With Alicent, that isn't really the case. She's a passive character for the first half of the season. For most of the season, she lets things happen to her. Now not every character in every story needs to be an active character like Rhaenyra. Sometimes it works for a supporting character who undergoes great change. From the beginning of the season to the end, Alicent probably changes the most, and I'm not talking about physically. Alicent ends the season as this assertive queen who starts to understand the Game of Thrones. How did she become this way? Remember, Alicent is this religious girl who follows all the rules. When she finds out that Rhaenyra goes against her religion in pretty much every way, and she breaks all the rules, she becomes resentful. It's easy for us to dislike a character who is jealous of someone else, but I don't blame her at all. How would you feel if you were forced to follow all these strict rules and others didn't have to and got away with it? She at first believes Rhaenyra that she didn't have sex, and because 
because of it, her father was removed as hand. When Alicent finds out the truth, she realizes she is all alone in King's Landing and needs to fight for herself. When she walks into the throne room with her green dress on, it's a powerful statement that she will embrace her own identity and not the Targaryen one. She is going to forge her own path, and this is the first time Alicent really made a decision of her own, and it was a powerful one. The politics of Westeros have forced Alicent to be separated from her father, and to be all alone in King's Landing. As I stated before, we see how it ruined her relationship with Rhaenyra. Now once we flash forward 10 years, then we start to see Alicent making some bad decisions. Alicent has a clear hatred of Rhaenyra, but pitting her sons against Rhaenyra's sons was an awful idea. It ties into this theme of the show that conflicts are being forced upon the next generation. Alicent is continuing Otto's brainwashing and telling Aegon that he must be prepared to become king. Does Alicent really believe that Rhaenyra would murder her kids if she became queen? I don't think so. In episode 6, Alicent is given the option to pretty much end all conflict between the Blacks and the Greens. Rhaenyra offers that Jaceris and Helena be betrothed, but Alicent would rather squander any hope of peace instead of marrying her daughter to a bastard. Now this is where the Game of Thrones universe is so interesting. Characters are often put in decisions that are not easy. She probably knows marrying her daughter to Rhaenyra's son would end any conflict, but then she would also be partaking in the falsehood of Jace's legitimacy. Alicent chooses her own righteousness instead of what's best for the realm. Maybe Alicent's most revealing scene in the season comes in episode 7 where she pretty much spews out why she hates Rhaenyra. She says, What have I done but what was expected of me? Forever upholding the kingdom, the family, the law, while you flout out all to do as you please. Where is duty? Where is sacrifice? It's trampled under your pretty foot again. This line perfectly illustrates Alicent's character. She's always felt trapped by the system that she lives in and she's always done her duty. But Rhaenyra hasn't and she gets all the love and support from the king. What a fantastic scene that was. Part of me also wonders if Alicent is jealous of how much better of a mother Rhaenyra seems to be. Luke and Jace seem like kind, good-hearted boys who respect their mother greatly. But when we look at Alicent's kids, one is an alcoholic rapist, one is a weird bug girl, and the other is a bloodthirsty fighter. It's her kids that act inappropriately at the family dinner, not Rhaenyra's kids. So I wonder if this is part of Alicent's frustration as well. By episode 8, Alicent begins to slightly change. It appears there is a chance that she and Rhaenyra could become friends again. But while they can rebuild that relationship, the damage to the children has already been done. Her kids were pretty much raised from birth to hate Rhaenyra's kids, and that brainwashing will not go away in a night. There's this great moment in the beginning of episode 7 where Aemon is about to approach Luke and maybe console him, but then he walks away, probably because he knows how his mother would feel if he's kind to Rhaenyra's kids. The damage has been done, the pieces have been moved. Maybe Alicent's most controversial scene is her final scene with Viserys where she misinterprets his words to mean that he wants Aegon to be king. There's a big debate online if Alicent actually believes this. I think partially yes and partially no. I think Alicent wants her son on the throne so badly she's basically hearing what she wants to hear from Viserys. But what's so frustrating is that deep down Alicent must know that isn't the case. Aegon said it perfectly. Viserys didn't love or care for Aegon. Why would he after 20 years decide to change who he wants to be heir? So maybe I'm wrong, but I think Alicent knows she is stabbing Rhaenyra in the back. In her final episode of the season, we see Alicent for the first time make numerous active decisions. She stands up to her father, and she sends her son and Kristen to find Aegon, basically competing against her father. Allison helps Aegon's rise to the throne, and I'm sure in the subsequent seasons she will face the consequences of that. She also had this great line when she was talking to Otto, where she said something like, reluctance to murder is not a weakness. I think that showed a lot about her personality, and that she's not some evil woman. And another active decision she makes is showing her feet to Laris to gain information. I just thought that was really funny. Alicent is a great character. We understand her her personality, we understand her flaws, we understand her motivations, and we understand her goals. Allison goes on an interesting arc of asserting herself in this patriarchal war, and while her actions piss me off immensely, there's no denying that she's just as three-dimensional as Rhaenyra. Up next, we have King Viserys Targaryen. A lot of people call Viserys the Ned Stark of the series, and that's pretty accurate. Viserys is quite unique in the Game of Thrones franchise in that he's really the only good man who's the king. So by the time we get to Viserys, it's refreshing to see someone on the Iron Throne who is a decent man. So while it is easy to compare him to Ned Stark because they both die in the first season and they are both good guys, Viserys is incredibly more flawed than Ned. And I'll provide examples over the next few minutes. The event that haunts Viserys throughout the series 
series is the death of his wife, which was partially his fault. He says he has this dream of his son becoming king, so he keeps on impregnating Emma until she inevitably dies of childbirth. Through his guilt and his love for his wife, he names Rhaenyra his heir. This, of course, is a big deal in the world of Westeros, naming a woman the heir to the Iron Throne. And tying into the theme of Game of Thrones, it doesn't matter what his intentions were. Actions have consequences, and naming Rhaenyra his heir will have immense consequences. Viserys is a walking example of how kindness and wholeheartedness is not a great trait to have as a ruler in Westeros. In Game of Thrones, it was Ned Stark's good heart and honor that got him killed. In House of the Dragon, it was Viserys' good heart and honor that led to war. In Episode 2, Viserys chooses Alicent as his wife. And by all accounts, this was an awful decision. He alienates the Valerians, he pissed off his daughter, and he puts love over duty. Of course, Alicent being queen and thus Otto being the grandfather of Viserys' children will have immense consequences. A common theme that I have focused on is how the feudalism of Westeros hurts people greatly. Viserys is the least harmed by this because he is the king, but I love how the show illustrates to us that he doesn't want to be king. He would rather live out his days being elsewhere. But because he was chosen, he has to be the king. And he also feels the responsibility of the Song of Ice and Fire, which shows how hypocritical he is because he doesn't often make decisions which are in the betterment of the realm. Viserys' biggest flaw is trying to please everyone. He's always trying to get everyone to get along with each other, but he never puts his foot down. Damon was right when he said Viserys was weak. There could have been multiple instances where he could have forced both sides of his family to make peace, but he didn't do so because he didn't want to upset anyone. I know earlier I talked about how Alicent made a selfish decision to not marry her daughter to Rhaenyra's son, but let's not forget that Helena is also Viserys' daughter. If he really wanted to, he could have forced this marriage, but no, he didn't want to upset Alicent. I talked earlier about how actions have consequences and how that is a key theme of Game of Thrones, but as a great man once said, not making a decision is a big decision. His inactions, just as much as his actions, will lead the country to war. Now, in my humble opinion, his final episode in episode 8 was his strongest performance. It's no surprise to hear me say that his arrival to court to help Rhaenyra was a highlight of the season. Ironically, Viserys at his weakest showed us his strength. He marched down the hall and sat the Iron Throne for the first time in probably years just to defend his daughter. That was a powerful moment to highlight what kind of man Viserys was. The other moment that really got to me was seeing his brief smile at dinner. I think in his own way, he has been waiting for his family to get along before he can die. Seeing this old sick man who's in so much pain enjoy such a small moment was so heartwarming. Many praise Paddy Considine for giving the best performance of the season, and moments like these make it hard for me to disagree. Now going back to his biggest flaws, his biggest flaw has to be the treatment of his children with Alicent. Not once in the three episodes after the time jump do we see Viserys have a conversation with one of his other kids. He yells at Aegon once or twice, and that was it. Viserys clearly loves Rhaenyra the most, but that doesn't mean he should have neglected his other kids. A major consequences of that is that Aegon became a piece of shit. We learn in episode 9 that the reason he is the way that he is is because he feels he never got the love from his parents that he deserved, and that will probably lead to Aegon making awful decisions going forward. Viserys, of course, shares many qualities with Ned Stark, but I feel the strongest similarity is the shadow that will loom large over the series. Even though Ned Stark died in season 1, his presence was felt for the rest of the series. I imagine the same will be said for Viserys. Just like Alicent and Rhaenyra, Viserys is a man who is fleshed out with his own strengths and flaws. He makes decisions, and those decisions already have had major consequences that he won't be able to face himself. But even with his many mistakes and flaws, Viserys was a great man, and I will sorely miss watching his character. Up next, we have Daemon Targaryen, the Rogue Prince. Daemon is a lot of people's favorite character, and it's not hard to understand why. Of all the characters in House of the Dragon, it may be Daemon who is actually the most fleshed out. Many people confuse Daemon's goals in this series. Some say Daemon is this evil man who wants the Iron Throne for himself. People accuse him of Second Son Syndrome, which Vaemond and Aemond clearly have. But to say Daemon wants the Iron Throne is incorrect. Daemon doesn't want to rule, he just wants the attention and love of his brother. Yes, there are plenty of times throughout the series where he purposefully pisses off Viserys, but more often than not, it is shown that he loves his brother in his own way. He wants to be hand so he can genuinely watch out for Viserys. Matt Smith does a fantastic job of showing how hard it is for Daemon to see Viserys in his weak state. But even then, when his crown falls off, Daemon is there to pick it back up and crown his brother. That was such a powerful moment, which was apparently improvised according to the showrunners. But anyway, Daemon is 
consistently making decisions that reveal more about his character. For one, he is not a very good man. He slaughtered potentially innocent people in the first episode, he commits war crimes in his battle against the Triarchy, he tries to fool around with his significantly younger niece, he kills Veymon for speaking the truth, and in the last episode, he is so hell-bent on war, which is not a good trait to have. Besides the moment where he picked up Viserys' crown, I loved his moment when he got the letter about the king sending help in episode 3, and then just marching into the enemy territory and ending the war. Granted, that was a bit un-Game of Thrones-like, the realistic consequence of that is that he would certainly die, but I didn't mind it too much. The other aspect of his character that is so fascinating is his unpredictability. At every turn, it's so hard to predict what he's going to do. One moment he may seem like this kind brother, and then the next he'll be trying to kill his wife. One minute he may be mourning the loss of his other wife, and the next he's laughing at her funeral. That unpredictability draws a lot of viewers in. But fans need to be careful not to think that Damon is secretly like Han Solo, a guy with a rough exterior who is a softy on the inside. Damon is a bad dude, and I've given plenty of examples why. Damon is consistently making decisions that reveal what kind of person he is, and in typical Game of Thrones fashion, he's not simply good or evil. Yeah, he does some bad shit, but he's grey just like everyone else in the world. When Damon is on screen, he has your attention, and I feel that is one of the strongest traits a character can have. The last character that I want to focus on individually is actually Otto Hightower. A lot of people look at Otto as a villain, and rightfully so. He does a lot of questionable things in the season. He pimps out his daughter to the king so he will marry her. He manipulates the king on several occasions to better his position. He manipulates his daughter into believing Rhaenyra will murder her children. And he's complicit in usurping Rhaenyra's claim to the throne by supporting Aegon. All of this is definitely true. But remember, a theme of House of the Dragon is how people are affected by the political system of Westeros, and Otto is no exception. When the queen dies, yeah, it is fucked that the first thing he wants to do is get Alicent in front of Viserys, but as a royal father, what is his duty? In this world, it is to marry his daughter off to a safe and good family. Viserys isn't a cruel man like Joffrey was, Otto isn't handing his daughter off to a vile man like Littlefinger did with Ramsay and Sansa. Otto knows that Viserys is a good man, so by the standards of Westeros, getting his daughter to not only marry a good man, but also the king of Westeros? is the best he can do for her. Later on when he speaks to Viserys about betrothing Rhaenyra to Aegon, sure we look at it as kinda gross considering how young Aegon is, and of course we see it as biased considering Aegon is his grandson, but from a logical perspective, it's a great fit. It keeps the family line strong, and it keeps the two sides from growing apart. Almost every time Otto has the opportunity to advance his house and his family, he takes it. But put yourself in his shoes as well. People scold him for telling Viserys about Rhaenyra having sex, but he's the king's hand. Isn't that what he's supposed to do? If the princess was committing actions that were incredibly damaging to the royal house, shouldn't the king know about it? There is totally another universe where Otto doesn't tell Viserys, and then Viserys gets mad at Otto for not saying anything. Moving on to the succession crisis. In Westeros, it is pretty much law that a man always comes first in inheritance. Yes, we the people that live in 2020 know how screwed up this is, but in Westeros, that's just how things work. And furthermore, if you saw the heir to the Iron Throne having bastard children, in lying about their legitimacy, wouldn't you be annoyed? Remember Ned Stark, the most honorable guy in Game of Thrones? He started a war because the Queen's children were illegitimate. But when Otto starts a war partially because the Queen's children are illegitimate, we say he's evil? Remember, just a day or so prior to Viserys' death, he saw Daemon murder a man who was only telling the truth and fighting for his rightful place as Lord of Driftmark. And a few years prior to that, it is believed that Rhaenyra and Daemon conspired to murder Laenor so they could get married. From his point of view, that's as evil as a thing as anyone can do in Westeros. So yeah, we see him as evil for wanting Rhaenyra and Daemon murdered, but wouldn't you be concerned too that Daemon would do something horrible to your family? And I have a gut feeling season 2 is gonna prove Otto right. House of the Dragon clearly paints the blacks in a positive light, and thus we see the greens and Otto as the bad guys. But what this tells us is the power of perspective, because if the story shifted to the point of view of Otto, he might be painted in a better light. People may see him as someone like Ned Stark. Now I'm not trying to say Otto is this good guy because he really isn't. You can arguably blame him for starting the entire war because he kept on telling Alicent that Rhaenyra would kill her children. But let's not act like Otto is this evil mastermind when a lot of the time his decisions and actions are totally justified. Like all the characters I mentioned before, Otto makes decisions that help us learn about him. And we also see how the feudalism of Westeros has affected him. But the opinion that so many people have of Otto fascinates me so much and highlights how important perspective is in a story. 
For a few minutes, I do want to devote a section to talk about some of the other characters in the series. Because even though I would argue the five characters I mentioned before are the five most important characters, there are still so many other characters in the series that have depth to them. First, we have Kristen Cole. Now, it's so easy to shit on Kristen because he's held a grudge against Rhaenyra for almost 16 years because of something he voluntarily partook in. But again, it's always fascinating to look at things from the other perspective. Kristen was someone who took his Kingsguard honor with great great pride. Since he didn't come from much, being granted the honor of Kingsguard is a big deal. Then Rhaenyra has sex with him, again something he voluntarily partook in. But to be fair, I would feel partially pressured if I was in his shoes. If your duties are to never have sex and to obey the princess, and the princess asks you to have sex, then what happens? Now again, Kristen wasn't forced to, but maybe he felt compelled to. He has to deal with his guilt and shame while Rhaenyra continues to sleep around. He blames Rhaenyra for breaking his vow he cherishes deeply. And we see him make decisions, like killing Joffrey Lonmouth or killing Lyman Beesbury, or partaking in dividing the Greens against the Blacks. Hate him or not, Kristen is a three-dimensional character who makes active decisions. Next, let's look at Aegon. Aegon is not a good dude. He's an alcoholic, he seems to only care about sleeping with women, and apparently he enjoys going to the fighting pits and watching children fight. So when Aegon is reluctant to become king, it totally makes sense given his character. But we slowly start to learn in episode 9 that the reason he is the way that he is is because he's felt neglected his whole life. He doesn't get the love from his father he feels he deserves, and his mother is always seen criticizing him. So what he does is either drink out his pain or look elsewhere for attention. That's why when he is finally crowned, there's this moment where everything changes for Aegon and he realizes he can get that attention from the people. Once he realizes this, then he starts embracing being the king. So even characters like Aegon who don't get much screen time are still three-dimensional. The last character I briefly want to talk about is Aemon. Because again, we understand what kind of person he is, and he makes decisions that support that. When we first meet Aemon, he is the kid who is insecure because he doesn't have a dragon. He gets bullied by his brother and his nephews because of it, so come episode 7, Aemon feels like the kid who needs to drive a giant truck to overcompensate for something small. So he's able to claim Vagar, the largest dragon in the world, and he has a massive power trip. And you can tell he still carries that on after the second big time jump. He now has the biggest dragon in the world. Well, he needs to live up to that, and he trains and studies to be the best Targaryen he can be. And in the season finale, he toys with Lucerys because he feels so much more powerful than him. But of course, he gets his ego checked and realizes he can't control Vagar, and then starts a war because of it. A lot of people say Aemond is this evil kid, but I don't see it that way. He just seems like more of a dick than someone who is genuinely evil. I cannot wait to see how he handles this situation in season 2. Some say accidentally killing Lucerys ruins his character, but I completely disagree with that. To me, it adds more layers to him because he's not this evil kid, just one who's kinda a jerk who makes a crucial mistake. So just like the others, Amond is a three-dimensional character who fits the world of Game of Thrones wonderfully. Another point I want to focus on is the pacing of this show. It's been a minute since I have seen a show this well paced. Some say the show is slow, but I fundamentally disagree. For one, every episode in this season feels like an episode of TV. It doesn't feel like an 8 hour movie cut up into a bunch of different pieces. Every episode has a purpose. Each one pushes both the plot and the characters forward. What this show excels at so well is building tension. The show uses our knowledge of how this world works to its advantage. You begin the series learning that the king doesn't have a son, and that his wife is currently pregnant. It's not common that a show focuses so much on a singular pregnancy, and when it does, usually that means something bad. Once we start to see that there are complications with the pregnancy, we can put the puzzle pieces together on how this is gonna end up. Not only will the queen die, but her newborn son will also die, leaving Viserys without an heir. And then the final scene of the episode makes a big deal of a woman being named heir to the Iron Throne, which contrasts the prologue which showed us how the realm will likely never accept a ruling queen. So right away, a bomb is placed. A woman is named Air. When will this go horribly wrong? And throughout every episode, the timer on the bomb just keeps ticking and ticking, approaching zero ever so slightly. Frankly, a better analogy for tension is a rubber band. As the show progresses, the writers are pulling their rubber band back wider and wider, with the tension increasing until at some point it will snap. We know the rubber band will break, but we don't know when. In episode 3, we see that Viserys does 
end up having a son. And we, the audience, know that could cause conflict in the future. The rubber band is being pulled. We see Alicent and Rhaenyra's relationship start to deteriorate. The rubber band is being pulled. We see the rising conflict between Alicent and Rhaenyra's kids. The rubber band is being pulled. As the season progresses, we see the declining health of Viserys. When the king dies, someone must be crowned in his absence. The rubber band is being pulled. Now, initially, we may think Viserys' death is when the rubber band snaps, but we know what's gonna happen afterwards. We know that Aegon will be crowned, and in episode 10, we know that Rhaenyra isn't just gonna start an open war yet. But after a season of characters being developed, relationships being established, intention being built, Aemond inadvertently kills Lucerys. The final shot of the season is Rhaenyra looking at the camera, giving the exact same look Daenerys gave right before she burned down King's Landing. The rubber band has snapped. War has begun. Roll credits. This was such a brilliant way to end the season. We all knew this was inevitable. This is Game of Thrones. A war has to be fought over the Iron Throne. And to end the season right as the rubber band has snapped was such a brilliant decision. Now it sucks as a fan because now we're left on a cliffhanger, but from a storytelling perspective, this was genius. House of the Dragon is a masterclass on pacing and building tension. And given the fact that this show had year-long time jumps a handful of times, the pacing being this good must be applauded. The last thing I want to talk about is dispelling one criticism that this show has received, and it's that major events are happening by accident. Alicent seemed content that Rhaenyra would be queen, but then misinterpreted what Viserys said, and that has now led to war. The other example is that Aemond accidentally killed Lucerys, which also led to war. I strongly disagree with these criticisms, and here's why. Yes, both these individual events happened by accident, but the show makes an effort to establish who these characters are before their respective moments. Alicent is someone who has been telling her son for almost two decades that he will become king. So in this moment, Viserys' vague words could only be misinterpreted by someone like Alicent, someone who's completely biased towards wanting her son on the Iron Throne. If Daemon heard these words, he wouldn't think that. If Rhaenys heard these words, she wouldn't think that. Only someone on Team Green who wants to see Aegon on the throne would misinterpret what he said to mean he wants Aegon to be king. So again, this didn't happen by accident. Alicent's life decisions have led to her hearing what she wants to hear in this moment. And something similar could be said about Aemond. Yes, Aemond didn't want to kill Lucerys, and that was an accident. But let's not ignore his entire character so far in this season. Aemond is someone who has an inflated ego. He's a great fighter, he's knowledgeable, and he rides the biggest dragon in the world. Of course he thinks he can do everything, including controlling Vagar. But as Viserys once said, the notion that the Targaryens control dragons is an illusion. Aemond's actions put himself in a situation where Lucerys could be murdered. If Jace was flying next next to his brother, he wouldn't have accidentally killed Luke. If Rhaenyra was flying next to Lucerys, she wouldn't have accidentally killed him. This tragedy could have only happened to Aemond because of his inflated ego and his pursuit to torment Luke. Here's an analogy. If you drank 10 beers and are feeling pretty drunk, and then you proceed to go driving and you get into a car accident, you wouldn't say that you accidentally got into a car accident. Sure, you didn't want to get into an accident, but you put yourself in a situation where the risks were there and you chose to ignore them. This is how I feel about these two situations with Alicent and Aemon. Yes, they may have been accidents, but the whole season has been building up to these moments to show us that it wasn't purely accidental. House of the Dragon Season 1. I am astonished that this show is as good as it is. If I had to choose Season 1 of Game of Thrones or Season 1 of House of the Dragon, it would be close, but I would still choose Game of Thrones. With Game of Thrones, I just liked the characters a bit more. We had characters like Robert and Tyrion and the Hound and Bronn who were frankly hilarious. I wouldn't say in House of the Dragon there are any characters that I love, even though they are all great. But it should be emphasized that creating a season of a show that is slightly worse than one of the best seasons in TV history with Game of Thrones Season 1 is still an amazing accomplishment. In my 45-minute Game of Thrones review that you guys should totally go watch if you haven't already, I spent a minute or so talking about the legacy of Game of Thrones. I talked about how the awful reception the last season got had permanently tainted the Game of Thrones franchise. I said that Game of Thrones would always be remembered for being great most of the time but having one of the worst endings ever put to TV. Now, House of the Dragon hasn't changed my opinion on the last season of Game of Thrones, in fact, the whole 
whole deal with the A Song of Ice and Fire prophecy has only reminded me of how dumb Season 8 was. But you can't deny that the brilliance of House of the Dragon has rejuvenated the Game of Thrones brand. People are excited to enter the world of Westeros again, and the viewership numbers of this season prove that. Nothing makes me more happy to look at my skeptical self three months ago and laugh at him for doubting this masterpiece. House of the Dragon Season 1 was borderline flawless, and without a doubt is the best season of TV to air in 2022.